Thanks for watching this special program, RPA, Powering Government's Digital Transformation, presented by UiPath. I'm your host, Francis Rose. According to Deloitte, simply automating tasks that computers already routinely do could free up nearly 97 million federal government working hours every year. That could save $3.3 billion, and those are conservative estimates. With that in mind, we've got a lot of ground to cover in the next 30 minutes, including the Office of Management and Budget's view on shifting from low value to high value work, what federal agencies are doing around robotic process automation right now, and RPA's impact on employees and employers. I'll be joined by guests from Deloitte, UiPath, NASA's Shared Services Center, and the Defense Logistics Agency. It's a great topic and a great lineup, so let's get right to it. Joining me first, Dave Mader, Civilian Sector Chief Strategy Officer at Deloitte and former controller at the Office of Management and Budget, and Donna O'Donnell, Director of Strategic Accounts at UiPath. Folks, thanks very much for joining me. Dave, I want to start with you. The terminology is M1823, the memo about shifting from low value to high value work. What's your takeaway from that? So, Francis, as you and I have talked over the year, um, I think one of the critical aspects of management reform has been the, the presence management agenda and then the corresponding you know, cross-agency priority goals. The OMB memorandum that you, that you mentioned actually sort of codifies what's in one of the cap goals around moving from low value work to high value work and, and clearly when you look across the, the breadth and depth of the government and you look at the processes that we use you know, to execute our mission Clearly, the, the use of RPA is starting to take hold, mm -hmm. and you know my my colleague here is going to talk more about what we've seen in the private sector because when we think about the government, we think about the private sector. Yes, there are differences, but there are a vast number of similarities where we've seen this automation result in efficiency and effectiveness for an organization, and that's one of the keynotes of the president's management agenda and what the administration is trying to accomplish. One of the things that I imagine, Donna, that's similar between private sector organizations and federal government agencies is at the beginning, they're asking probably the same questions. Absolutely. What are those questions? First of all, between the private sector and the public sector, the government sector, all processes that can be automated are all the same. It could mm -hmm. be HR, it could be supply chain management, it could be invoicing. So basically all companies and all government processes are all the same and, and they want a lower cost, they want a faster production, they want to be more efficient mm -hmm. and they want to do it fast and they want to do it quickly and the bottom line result is, uh, is, is what they're looking for. What's the high value work that the people who don't do the low value work anymore shift to? Do we have a picture of how that's played out in the private sector? That's an interesting thing. So first let's back up. So robotic process automation is anything, any task done within the enterprise space or the government space for a mundane or repetitive, repetitive task, robotic process automation can be taken over. Our goal is, is that we take those mundane and repetitive tasks that people might not like so much within their job and focus on more creative work that's more exciting to them. Mm -hmm. In the intelligence community, they're describing it and they're using it in the artificial intelligence context too, Dave, as uh, freeing people from not doing rote work and allowing them to be more creative, doing more analytical work. Is that something that you expect to see in some of the uh, kinds of disciplines that Donna talked about a moment ago? You know, clearly in, in organizations like CFOs and, and human capital acquisition, we're already seeing it with, with the clients that we're working with, whether it's Treasury Department or USDA or GSA. And, and I think to Donna's point, what, what we're seeing is that the benefit is these processes not only took staff power, but, but because people were involved, I mean, there was a certain amount of quality issues that you had with you know constantly doing these kinds of manual transmitting from you know a spreadsheet to a computer and back and forth with process robotics you really get a hundred percent quality once you have that new process in place using the the, the technology that's available. And the industry's booming. The industry's booming. A couple of years ago it was a two hundred and fifty million dollar industry and we're looking at to be three point four billion by two thousand twenty one. Also to give you an ex another example of the growth um, we were we went from 
1 million to 110 million within 21 months. We are just listed in the Wall Street Journal as the fastest enterprise software company in history. What's driving that interest? Is it just we want to save money? Or is it also the business efficiencies, or maybe the business efficiencies more important than the cost savings? It's absolutely both. It's, it's um, saving money, it's efficiencies. Um, the bottom line, I, I could give you an example. If you look at the mortgage industry, your daughter applies for a mortgage. Prior, in the past, she would go in line or she would go to the bank. To get that pre-approved rate, it would take about four days in order to figure out what that interest rate would be. Robotic automation, RPA is now doing that. The credit check and the employee verification now, she finds out in six seconds. She doesn't price shop. That bank is getting exponentially more mortgages without lowering their interest rate. Mm -hmm. So it's speed of execution, um, which, is, it, which is driving businesses um, to move forward. In the, in the past, clients used to say, wow, this is so interesting. Now they're like, holy cow, I'm behind the eight ball. Mm -hmm. How do we sign up quicker? And because of that, we won back the majority of the, the Fortune 30 from GE to Walmart to Exxon, and we're growing about six new clients a week. In, in just a few minutes, Dave, we're going to hear from some people who are already doing this in the federal government, talking about how they're, they're not thinking about it, they're not analyzing it, they're doing it. Where are the biggest opportunities, do you think? You, we've talked about some of the disciplines where RPA technology will be, uh, will proliferate in the coming years, but what are, the, what are the opportunities to move very quickly in the government? I think throughout that sort of C-suite within the federal space, um, the acquisition, the, you know, the HR, I even think in the legal profession within Correct. the government, there's an opportunity to, to deploy this. And I think, you know, besides the efficiency and effectiveness, I think at least from the federal perspective, from my experience, there's also an aspect about recruiting and retention the retaining the future workforce. Mm -hmm. You know, people want to come to work to do challenging things, not to sit and move data right. from an Excel spreadsheet to a computer keyboard. I mean, that's just not appealing to mm -hmm. people going forward. So to me, it's not only the efficiency, effectiveness, but it's also about the future workforce and the kinds of opportunities that we want to give them in the federal government. Donna, we have about a minute left. What do you see as the biggest uh, uh, hurdles to agencies that are trying to implement this technology for the first time? I think that the biggest hurdle might be to, number one, is to let the agencies know it's not about the hype. Mm -hmm. It's RPA is here. It's full force, it's fully operational in these large companies. And then number two is to take away the disruptor factor of it. How do you put people at ease to know that their job is not necessarily going away, but it's moving to something more exciting and more fun? So those would be the two, the two pieces. Donna O'Donnell, Dave Mater, thanks both very much for joining me. Thank you, Francis. Thank you, Francis. Up next, we'll shift our focus from the administration's vision for robotics process automation to work federal agencies are doing right now. You're watching RPA, powering the government's digital transformation on the Government Matters Thought Leadership Network. Do you know why robots are here? So we are free to do the things we love so we don't spend hours and days and weeks doing one tedious thing after another. The truth is, this is the ultimate collaboration. Robots do all the boring backroom stuff, so we don't have to. We can dream big and push ourselves to be our best versions so that everyone progresses, everyone wins. Welcome back to this special program, RPA, Powering Government's Digital Transformation. I'm your host, Francis Rose. The list of practical uses for RPA is long, and it includes a variety of financial management, procurement, human resource applications as well. Here, you'll learn about the state of the art from a group of leaders in the RPA field. Kenneth Newton is Director of Service Delivery at NASA's Shared Services Center. John Felstead is Division Chief for Enterprise Integration and Technology Services at the Defense Logistics Agency. And Jonathan Paget is Vice President of U.S. Public Sector at UiPath. Gentlemen, thanks all very much for joining. Ken, I want to start you with you. Thank Tell you. me about what you're doing with RPA at NASA's Shared Services well, Center. We're, we're really excited about uh, what uh, robotic process automation is bringing to the table for us. 
Uh, we uh, have been operating for about 12 years now, and we've been uh, started the journey in RPA about two years ago. Uh, we started with uh, proof of concept uh, in, in, in human resources, in procurement, in financial management, in enterprise services, as well as uh, agency business services. And so we're uh, um, looking to, to utilize uh, RPA to really free up resources to invest in, in higher value work uh, for NASA, uh, really looking to, to engage the customer experience. And, and that takes a, a personal touch. Uh, for NASA, and so um, um, we are we are moving along. Uh, we now have over 300 projects in the pipeline. Uh, we have completed and we have operational some 10 to 15 uh, projects, and uh, we have another 46 projects that we have ready to begin uh, uh, work construction development. I want to come back to those projects okay. that you're moving forward on. It sounds okay. like you're in phase two, three, or four of RPA, where a lot of agencies are just getting started. John, Very tell exciting. me about where you are at DLA. Well, it's much the same same areas that we're moving into uh, for us, specifically uh, uh, inventory reconciliation, uh, contract uh, processing, uh, uh, the onboarding process, yeah. which is a huge part, you know, getting people in. and. Uh, even determining costs for fuels. So DLA's primary is their primary mission is support of the warfighter. Mm -hmm. That's priority one. So the more efficient we can make our employees, the more it benefits the warfighter fighter down at the end of the chain. How long have you been doing this? We have only been doing it about nine months, but mm -hmm. we're moving along pretty rapidly. We went from proof of concept. Uh, we've got buy-in all the way up to our director. Our CIOs bought in. Our directors bought in. They want this to happen. So. We've, we've moved along pretty rapidly. We've already got three or four bots in production running these processes for us right now. And we've got people coming to us left and right wanting to automate more things. John, you've got agencies here that are kind of at two ends of the spectrum when it comes to RPA and the government mm -hmm. right now. What's in between? What are you seeing agencies doing in, from the, uh, in between these opposite ends of the spectrum? Well, I think we're, we're seeing a nice adoption of RPA across the different branches of government. Uh, it seems to be to be fairly even. Um, I'm seeing a rapid adoption as far as uh, the number of bots that people are bringing online. Um, the, you know, the government tends to be a little bit risk adverse, so we saw a slower adoption in the beginning. But government uh, agencies are seeing that they can uh, recoup an ROI within six months. Mm -hmm. The projects can usually be self-funded within a six months to a year. Um, and uh, we're seeing a lot of uh, adoption in, in the UI, in, uh, RPA space. Any common threads in what agencies are doing that maybe these gentlemen didn't mention, or are they kind of covering the waterfront as far yeah. as what people are doing? Yeah, so uh, uh, there are two processes, really. There's the back office process, which is the swivel chair, uh, and then there's the front office. So we're seeing an adoption within the back office process, so invoice management, procure to pay, Freeing up folks to do higher value tasks is what we're what we're really seeing, and and the nice thing that John mentioned is that we're seeing uh, agencies start to be able to, to deliver better government and create happier employees with the adoption of process robotics. So that's where I wanted to go next. Is one of the fears I think among people when they he heard about this idea at the beginning. You probably experienced right. this, uh, Ken, when you first started was this they're going to try to figure out a way to make my job obsolete how did you either of you deal with that when that first came down the pipe yeah actually yeah. we were we were concerned that they would take it that way of, of course you would see it that way but uh, when we went in we started working through the process you sit down with them you go over the processes mm -hmm. once people seen what it was able to do and and do this mundane daily grind work it's still stuff that has to be done mm -hmm. but it's this it's typical hand jamming we got to take this here move it over here it's work that needs to be done it's not glorious, it's not great work, but it's work that has to be done. Now that we've got the bot doing that work, they're freed up to do other things. So it's not like we've taken their job away. We've just taken this part away that takes up a large portion of the day. There's really no job satisfaction in it. And it's improved, actually, employee morale. And much like any outside of the government, any commercial company, you want to retain good employees. Mm -hmm. So this has actually improved their morale. They're enjoying their jobs better. It's made a difference that way. Did no, you Nobody is, is pushed back. As a matter of fact, our hardest part is we got more people coming to us. Can you do this? Can you automate that? And that's what we're dealing and, with and, now. And exactly what John said is, is our folks are really excited about this. Because we, getting started early on, we did lunch and learns. Mm -hmm. And we talked about, asked them, what things, the mundane things that you do every day that you would like a robot to do on your behalf? Mm -hmm. And so the 300 projects that I talked about, 
those are employee ideas. Interesting. Those are from mm -hmm. the bottoms up. And actually, our, our mm -hmm. contractor, um, um, uh, GDIT, is incentivizing their employees and giving them bonuses mm -hmm. for just the idea. And then they give them a little bit more if that idea is implemented. Mm -hmm. So uh, our employees are fully engaged uh, and empowered uh, to look at doing higher value work where they're engaging with our customers and letting the bots take care of the back office administrative tasks. And, and employees talk too, right? So if somebody says, no, this is great, and they start talking to their coworkers they do lunch with, next thing you know, their coworkers are calling us. Hey, I talked to John or talk to whoever's in the program. Mm -hmm get them on board, it's been that. We get more from word of mouth than anything else. We've got people just coming to us, hey, can you do this? Are you the right person to talk to? Yep, yep, let's, let's see what we can do for you. John Padgett, you're nodding over there well, yeah, enthusiastically say, yeah, as they're so, talking about the employee engagement yeah, piece of this. Absolutely, and, and one of the ways that uh, some of our uh, customers approach their employees is what part of your job do you hate the most? <laughs> and that really opens up a very interesting conversation uh -huh. of, yes. well, what if, right? What if you had a digital assistant to help you you know, through process forms and back office invoicing and procure to pay, NHR onboarding and all of these things that we've talked about. So it, it's actually quite exciting. You use a term there that I think is interesting because we talk about, we, we've used the term robots and robotic. Mm -hmm. Digital assistant sounds far less intimidating to the employee yeah. than the term robot. Robot, I guess, implies somebody's going to come in and take over for you. Digital assistant means a helper to mm -hmm. let you go and do the other thing. And that takes me to where I want to go next, which is, you're fulfilling the vision that the administration has yes. for moving from low value to high value work in the president's management agenda. Mm -hmm. What's the manifestation of that? What among the 300 programs that you've done? Give me a kind of a sense of where you've seen a good return on that. Well, well we're still early. Uh -huh. We're still early, and, and uh, uh, we've only freed up uh, about four or five uh, working equivalents uh -huh. uh, so far. That's but what's a in lot. the pipeline is is just. Um, it, and this is strictly within the shared services environment. Mm -hmm. uh, we're working with the CIO, we're working with the CFO, we're working with uh, our, our Chico, uh, a, as well as other entities um, um, within the CIO's organization to roll this out to the agency. Yeah. So we are just scratching the surface within shared services. Uh, ultimately, this is going to be a tool that all of NASA can tap in for their uh, back office uh, um, activities. John Padgett, is there one place where you think there's the biggest potential for an agency, one area that we've talked about, or is it widespread enough that it's hard to focus in just one segment? I think it's hard to focus in one segment. I think uh, the, the future is bright for call center automation as far as augmentation of helping uh, calls be uh, processed much more quickly uh, through agents uh, leveraging attended bots. Uh, to serve its constituents much more quickly mm -hmm. in, in the in the call process. What are the things that agencies should be doing now if they're not as far down the path as these gentlemen are to analyze, ask their employees questions and so on, prepare for this that's coming? I think that RPA needs to have a place in the automation roadmap, right? And agencies need to start thinking about process robotics along with AI and that they're hand in hand and work together. It, it has become a part of our continuous improvement program. It is it is foundational now mm -hmm. in in uh, doing continuous improvement because we are constantly looking at how we can bring value to NASA, and this gives us that opportunity to bring even greater value. Once uh, to people our started to learn, we have about thirty seconds left. Once okay. people started to learn about this, John, what did they come to you and say? What did they ask you about how it could help them? Really well, really they just come to us. Can you do this? Can you do that? Mm -hmm. And we say, no, well, we don't know, right? We'll sit down with you and you've got to go over the process with them from beginning to end and see what the bot can actually do and what it can't do. Most of the time we find out we're actually surprised we learned it could even do more than what we initially thought it could do. Mm -hmm. Our biggest challenge is trying to hold people back. There's only so many of us and you've got to set people down with people who do that every day to, to take that process, make it so the bot can mimic it and do it. And there's only so much to go around. So you've got to prioritize these things. We'd love to get to everybody quickly, but uh, like I said, there's such a overwhelming, people overwhelmingly embracing this that it's difficult to get to everybody. John Felstead, John Padgett, Ken, thank you very much for joining us. I appreciate it. Thank, thank you. you very much. Yeah. RPA is accessible to everyone, including governments and the citizens that depend on them. That concept forged a new term that's easier to understand than it is to say. Automation democratization. Its potential impact on employees and employers right after this. Do you know why robots are here? So we are free to do the things we love. 
so we don't spend hours and days and weeks doing one tedious thing after another. The truth is, this is the ultimate collaboration. Robots do all the boring backroom stuff, so we don't have to. We can dream big and push ourselves to be our best versions so that everyone progresses, everyone wins. So far, you've learned about the White House push to move federal workers from low value to high value work and some best practices from a pair of agencies that are leading that charge. Here, we look at the future of RPA, its impact on government, and how agencies can procure software to do RPA all on their own. Here to wrap things up, Joe Edwards, Product Marketing Manager for UiPath, Jim Walker, Director of Public Sector Marketing for UiPath, and Christina Caldon, RPA Developer for UiPath. Thanks all very much for joining me. Joe, I want to start with you. Tell me what you've heard so far on the program. What's your number one takeaway about the discussion so far? RPA is not taking away jobs. Mm -hmm. It's a way to augment what you do. It's a way to make you more creative. And fundamentally, it's about taking away the things that you don't want to do. So I'm even developing bots for my own life. I'm trying to think, you know, what are the repetitive tasks that I can knock out with a bot to free me up to do uh, more value-added things? Jim, I think you and I are probably the only people at this table that remember using macros. And I think of that idea when I think about bots, except Maybe macros on steroids might be the term for it. Am I thinking the right thing? You're, you're thinking close, but the nice thing about these bots, you had Ken Newton on earlier, and Ken's first bot was George Washington. Mm -hmm. You're able to apply a kind of a personality to them, and when you do that, your security people are thinking about that bot and the way it's configured from a personal perspective, and you're asking, what can George do for us? Mm -hmm. And so while it is a macro, the ability to go to other systems and run on the network by itself certainly make it a very new technology and as uh, Christina will tell you it's a technology that a lot of people will be able to use it's not going to be restricted to a, a higher level developer mm -hmm. well tell me about that Christina what makes this technology accessible for people kind of at all levels of the chain not just technologists okay so I have a background in physics and astronomy and I'm self-taught software engineer and I think a lot of the new software engineers are like that they are learning on YouTube, they're learning on Academy, what we offer mm -hmm. for free. And I think it's just really great that the tool is really useful. It's drag and drop, it's visual. It's something that you can actually see. It has a feel of Microsoft Visio. So you can kind of build it, and it has a logical flow for people who even aren't technical. Mm -hmm. Joe, I want to come back to this idea about the workforce because this is a thread in every conversation that I have about all of the tools that agencies are looking at, not just RPA, but also artificial intelligence and machine learning and all of these things. The worry among the rank and file employee is they won't need me anymore because this thing will do the job that I used to do. As I listen to our practitioners in the last part of our conversation talk about this issue, sounds to me like there will be more work to do because the RPA bots will be able to do a volume of work that people would have never gotten to, and now there will be an opportunity for all those folks to do a lot more left-brain analytical type things. Am I, is, that, is that what the argument here is? Yes, absolutely. I mean, even personally, you know, I, I'm trying to write myself out of a job somewhat. <laughs> uh, we're developing bots that can do a lot of the work that I do in, in coordinating uh, information and, and identifying how big our community is. You know, we have this large academy, as, as they mentioned, and we have uh, a, a suite of tools and products out there is, that sometimes it's hard to get a track of just how big is the UiPath family growing. So, you know, we'll do a data call through emails, but a bot can easily do that in seconds. So. Um, I jokingly say I'm trying to retire early myself, but it's not allowing me to retire. You know, it's just freeing me up to do other things in the day. So I think it's definitely something that is an augmentation, not a replacement. What difference will this make for the employer side of the employer-employee equation? So I, I think employers are going to have this brand new workforce. I've been retired for a year, and it's been so interesting to me to really be sandwich between millennials and their willingness to be self-learners and to do new things. Uh, a, lot, a lot of their efforts are not risk averse, it's where's the next big risk I can take on. And so employers are going to have to provide avenues for them to do self-learning. Uh, our academy, a three-week self-learning opportunity, says go learn, don't be a physicist, be a bot developer. 
And so it's completely different from the old school of you come in, you roost for years and years in a company or roost in an agency and, and do the same job all the time. The new workforce is going to be self-learners and opportunities that RPA is going to do is free them up for those learning opportunities. Christina, tell me what the term democratized robots means and how it applies to the discussion that we've had so far today. So I think of democratized robots in a sense that uh, we all have a say in what they're going to do and how we're going to implement them. So if you want to automate certain parts of your day, maybe it's with a attended bot that you kick off the process, you really get a say in what you're going to do and what the bot's going to do. Mm -hmm. And that really helps in what you're going to automate in how your day is really going to go with this and where the bots are going to be implemented. So I want to connect that idea to what you talked about a couple of minutes, Joe, and this idea that it sounds like the potential exists, maybe not today and maybe not this year, but at some point in the future, the programs that, for example, Ken talked about that he's running at NASA, people will be able to just kind of do their own thing, create their own ideas to help their own jobs not necessarily sanctioned by an agency, maybe with the awareness and, and permission of the people up the chain. But this is not something that's limited to the technology shop's going to do this and then set it free for the rest of the organization, is it? Absolutely. I mean, I started at uh, Treasury last year. That's how I first discovered UiPath. And we had an R&D lab where um, this business employees, you know, people who had very specific subject matter expertise in their area were able to develop these bots in a very quick amount of time and I think that's the new paradigm where um, you don't have to necessarily rely on IT to, to do all things technical. I think you should definitely have them involved, definitely have them um, have a say in the governance and the structure of the programs, but as far as actually building the bots out, I think it's, it's open for uh, anyone to learn and, and develop one. What do you think, Jim, the next year looks like in RPA? If we sat down a year from today in October of 2019, where are we at that point, do you think? So I think with the, the new memorandum, the, I think it's 1823, I think we'll see a lot of people and agencies looking at RPA, but also there's a lot of talk about, oh, there's artificial intelligence. And one of the nice things about your investment in RPA today is that thinking brain that is cognitive robotics needs to be able to hand it off to a laborer, mm -hmm. RPA. And so I think we'll see a beginning of some agencies, some of the, the leader agencies like DLA, say, well, what's the next thing for us and let's do a pilot. And I think you'll see a lot of agencies that aren't using robotics realize that their peers were kind of the leaders mm -hmm. and it's now time to pick up the mantle and, and bring it into their agency also. So you mentioned the uh, OMB memorandum and those memoranda are terrific at driving behavioral change. The challenge is that agencies historically see those types of guidance and go, okay, well, we need to go do this and figure out some reason to go do whatever the memorandum says to do. Right. How do you suggest that agencies turn that around and do it, think about their missions, think about the jobs that they want to accomplish, and then think about using the technology in that way to kind of put the cart before the horse, I guess. Certainly. So with, with years of time in IT and government, a lot of times you buy something expensive and everybody promises greatness mm -hmm. and the results are not there. Starting out with a small pilot is what I've seen every agency I've talked to do, but you're at the point now where you don't need to do too small of a project because other agencies can validate that this works. But you need to sit down and say, we need more people. How many people in your office have three terminals? If they've got three terminals, they're m moving data back and forth. Mm -hmm. They're the right candidate for, let's get a robot in there to do that work for them so that they can be more customer facing. You know, whether they're at a Veterans Administration meeting a vet, or if they're at, at a driver's license location and they're getting people through their license faster. Jim, Data's not it. Jim, Christina, Joe, thanks all very much for joining me. I appreciate it. Thanks, thank sir. you. And thank you for watching this special program, RPA, Powering Government's Digital Transformation, presented by UiPath. For more information on the subject matter discussed today, go to govmatters.tv slash UiPath. For the Government Matters Thought Leadership Network, I'm Francis Rose. Thank you.